For the last 30 years, persistent drought has greatly impacted the southwestern United States and northern Mexico. This drought makes it harder for ranchers to have good feed and water available for their livestock. Therefore, it might be opportunistic for ranchers to choose cattle breeds which are adapted to this climate and topography in order to maximize the feed resources without degrading them. I'm presently in my 29th year of ranching full-time. Basically, our ranch is uh, straight north of Bisbee. Our ranch headquarters is approximately 18 miles from the Mexican border. So we're in the southeast corner of Arizona. I first heard about Criollo cattle probably as a 15-year-old teenager. Criollo cattle seem to be a possible answer for ranchers wanting to try to match the genetics to the environment. But where do they come from? In 1493, Christopher Columbus traveled from Spain through the Canary Islands to Hispaniola with Spanish cattle. In 1600, Spanish cattle are in South and North America. In 1650, Spanish cattle through natural selection adapt to varied climates and become known as Criollo. In 2005, Dr. Ed Fredrickson and Alfredo Gonzalez were working on a project related to long-term drought and climate change for the Ronada Experimental Ranch in New Mexico. They located two populations of Criollo cattle that appeared to have never been outcrossed with another breed. Both of the groups came from extremely isolated parts of Mexico. They chose the Criollo cattle that were with the Tarahumara Indians in the Copper Canyon in Chihuahua. This group of Criollo cattle is called Raramuri Criollo. I told Ed that I was very interested in these cattle and I had had some previous experience with some longhorn crosses and the idea of raising purebred Criollo was very appealing to me. When I started putting Criollo cattle out on the ranch and people would drive by, they'd be like, so are you raising roping cattle now too? Or are you? And I was like, no, these are actually meat cattle. These are beef animals. And um, they're, you know, from the same genetic origins, but they have not been subjected to the same selection pressure. Basically, they rolled their eyes and said, well, he's a little different anyway, so good luck, you know. that. I mean, it, nobody wanted our bulls jumping the fence and going on to their ranches. That was real clear. The conventional industry abandoned the Criollo cattle because its phenotype did not fit the industrial production model goals. The U.S. market favors black Angus cattle. Spots are not an advertisement for high-quality feedlot cattle. And consequently, if they have spots or horns, and worse, if they have both, that's not the way to sell them, which is why we do what we do. The cattle that we raise and take to slaughter has spent their, they were born on the range, lived their entire lives on the range, and are produced without growth stimulating unnatural hormones or subclinical levels of antibiotics 
or grain feeding, but they may take two and a half years to reach marketable weights where conventional cattle are going to slaughter oftentimes at 14 months of age. So essentially what we're producing is an animal that lives the same or similar kind of lifestyle to a deer or an elk. Where these cattle excel is gaining on rangeland conditions in tough environments. Where they don't do so well is being crowded in feedlots. I've seen cows reach out with their tongue deep into a choya and lick the choya bud out of the cactus and munch it down. Their grazing behavior is really good for maintaining rangeland condition. They don't camp out in one area and just grub out one species of grass, but they tend to be nibblers and walkers. So they're, they'll travel all day or all night in, in many cases, especially during the hotter weather. But sampling plants and moving, they don't just stay in one area and muck out an area. They're very smart. They, as soon as you come in horseback, they line out and start walking to the next pasture. Um, they have uh, some natural behaviors that make them more predator resistant than some other breeds. So when confronted with predators, they tend to circle up and face outward. They have these very large, very sharp horns that are pretty intimidating anyway, but the fact that they know how to use them really well doesn't hurt. Since 2017, research is being conducted on Dennis Moroni's Criollo cattle through the University of Arizona. I felt that getting research on our cattle on our ranch, which is a unique place with a unique set of um, ecological sites, a very diverse plant community, very interesting geological history, and therefore pretty interesting variety of soils. And all of these things would have an impact on meat quality, flavor, tenderness, the fat composition. And I just felt like there's a lot of claims made that grass-fed meat is healthier. Grass-fed meat is better. Grass-fed meat is heart healthy um, and so on. And I, I like that idea, but where's the research to back it up? Where's the facts about that? And the more you look, the more you find, well, there's a, an obscure study here or an obscure study there that's appropriate for that landscape and for that breed and their product. But here's an opportunity to do research through a land-grant institution, the University of Arizona, um, looking at the grazing behavior, the diet selection, and the correlation between those things and the meat quality, I have not been sorry at all. We've learned some things that I did not know about how these cattle were behaving, and in particular in the diet selection area, certain plants that they were eating that I was very surprised that they were eating them. I think that these 
these cattle and the research findings help to confirm to me that this is a genetic package that is very well matched to food production in this environment. This particular breed, I think, is a, is a good tool for sustainably utilizing these marginal landscapes for food production. And I think that's going to end up being one of the big reasons why ranchers will continue to show an interest in the breed. If you're not constantly trying to do a little bit better, then you're not really living up to what I feel is, is uh, our responsibility as food producers. We ought to be trying to do a better job all the time.